Hello, everyone. Thank you for attending Diodes Incorporated's product training module entitled DC to DC Synchronous Buck Converter Introduction. This is an agenda of the talking points of this module. It starts with a brief explanation and operation of buck converters, goes through common device features, and finishes up with introducing some design considerations when selecting components. A buck converter is a type of switching regulator. It is also known as a step-down converter, where the input voltage is stepped down from a higher voltage to a lower output voltage. The buck converter also maintains or regulates this new output voltage at the desired level. The operating voltage requirements of different electronic devices today can vary widely. A stable voltage needs to be supplied for each of these devices, thus requiring the use of buck converters. A synchronous buck converter uses integrated power MOSFETs as its switching elements. This is portrayed as Q1, the high side FET, and Q2, the low side FET, in the picture on this slide. Additional external passive elements like an inductor and capacitor are used to store energy for proper operation. The AP6XXXX family of parts is the nomenclature of Diodes' new generation of synchronous buck converters. Since the synchronous buck converter is a switching regulator, the switching elements, Q1 and Q2, alternate turning on and off during each switching cycle. In the first part of the switching cycle, Q1 turns on while Q2 turns off. The direction of current flow in this configuration is shown as red arrows in the picture on this slide. During this time when Q1 is on, the current is being supplied to the output load from the input through the inductor. As the inductor current is increasing, energy is being stored in the inductor. The output capacitor is also being charged by this current, so energy is stored there as well. In the next part of the switching cycle, Q1 turns off and Q2 turns on. Again, the direction of current flow in this configuration is shown as red arrows on the slide. During the time when Q2 is on, the inductor current decreases and is initially still supplying current to the output load and capacitor. Once the inductor's energy decreases enough, the output capacitor takes over, using up its stored energy and supplies current to the load. When this part of the cycle ends, the beginning of the next cycle starts with Q2 turning off and Q1 turning on. This sequence repeats every cycle. The required output voltage of a buck converter can be achieved by two main modes of operation, pulse width modulation, known as PWM, and pulse frequency modulation, known as PFM. Devices operating in PWM does its switching following a fixed frequency. This happens when the output has a high load, so the buck converter continually has to switch to supply current to the output. PWM operation allows for small output voltage ripple, making it easier to filter the noise downstream. For PFM, the device switches to provide power to the output load only as needed while still maintaining output voltage regulation and meeting load demand. Thus, the average switching frequency in PFM is reduced. In theory, a device in PFM can wait as long as it needs to before it determines it needs to switch again, so the average switching frequency can be very low. When there is light load, the current consumed by the buck converter itself is less since it is not switching as often. This helps the overall converter efficiency at light loads. There is actually a third mode of operation called ultrasonic mode, or USM. This mode is similar to PFM except for one key difference. Whereas PFM operation can allow the average switching frequency to go as low as it needs to, USM will clamp the switching frequency above the audible frequency range at light load conditions. The graphs on the slide show the differences in switching frequency versus output load using Diodes' AP62600 synchronous buck converter as an example. The AP62600 can select its mode of operation to be in PFM, USM, or PWM only, sometimes called force PWM. In heavy load conditions, the switching frequency, regardless of operation mode, switches at its set maximum frequency. In PWM only operation, the device's switching frequency is constant regardless of the output load. The switching frequency is the same at light load as well as at full load conditions. In PFM or USM, as the load decreases, the average switching frequency also decreases, 
As mentioned in the previous slide, PFM operation allows the device's average switching frequency to decrease as low as it needs to go. However, USM will clamp the frequency above the audible range, as shown in the graph on the right. In forced PWM operation, the switching frequency is constant since the power MOSFETs are always switching regardless of load. If the load is very light, the device's own power consumption dominates the total system power dissipation, which leads to poor power conversion efficiency. This can be seen in the green signal in the above efficiency chart. PFM operation addresses the forced PWM operation's light load efficiency issue by decreasing the amount of switching the device does at light loads. The end result is a higher light load power conversion efficiency as seen in the blue signal in the chart above. Lastly, USM is somewhere in the middle between PFM and forced PWM. As the load decreases, the switching frequency in USM also decreases. However, since the device also needs to ensure that the switching frequency stays above the audible range, it is forced to switch more often than if it were purely in PFM mode. This extra switching required to stay above the audible range at light loads results in a trade-off in efficiency that is lower than PFM's efficiency, but higher than forced PWM's efficiency. USM's power conversion efficiency is shown as the red signal in the chart above. The control architecture of a DC to DC buck converter determines when to turn on and off its power MOSFETs to perform the necessary power conversion. The two main common control architectures in DC to DC buck converters are the peak current mode control and constant on time, or COT control. There are advantages and disadvantages of using one control architecture over another. In peak current mode control, some of its advantages are that it is easier to create a mathematical model since it can be approximated as a linear system. Also, DC to DC converters using peak current mode control have an easier time to run in a 100% duty cycle, which means that the highest power MOSFET, Q1, is always on. This is useful because the output voltage can still maintain regulation as the input voltage falls closer to the output voltage. One potential disadvantage is that the peak current mode control architecture requires loop compensation for stability. In constant on-time control, some of its advantages are that, since it is using hysteretic control, it has inherent stability. It also has the fastest load transient responses at around 50% duty cycle. However, at high duty cycle operation, COT's transient response can be slow. In addition, COT designs rely on being able to detect some of the output voltage ripple to function properly. Therefore, it is more sensitive to noise that may be introduced to the system. There are certain common device features that offer different benefits to the final system design. Different DC to DC buck converter ICs come with different feature sets. The feature set of interest depends on the end application requirements. The table above introduces some of the common features and their corresponding benefits. The first feature to introduce is called LDO mode. In other words, the device has 100% duty cycle capability. At 100% duty cycle, the device can be considered to be acting like an LDO, regulating the output. The maximum regulated output voltage can be as high as the input voltage. The second feature is called frequency spread spectrum, or FSS. FSS dithers the switching frequency back and forth from its nominal switching frequency. What this accomplishes is that it reduces EMI by not allowing emitted energy to stay in any one frequency for a significant period of time, and spreads the emitted energy over a wider frequency band. A third feature is the ability to adjust the DC to DC converter's switching frequency itself. This feature allows design flexibility. A lower switching frequency can allow higher power conversion efficiency. On the other hand, a higher switching frequency can allow for smaller inductor and capacitor sizes, reducing the total solution footprint on the board. The next common feature is the ability to adjust the soft start time. This feature is used to decrease the inrush current on device startup. In another device feature, an external compensation pin allows the fine-tuning of the system's closed loop response based on the system designer's requirements. Next, a power good pin, or PG pin, is a signal generated by the converter once the output voltage is within regulation. This PG signal is useful for startup sequencing. The last common feature mentioned here is the operation mode select. This is the ability to select if the device operates in PFM or forced PWM, and sometimes even USM. This provides design flexibility to select the mode of operation best suited for a particular application.
Both on this slide and the next show some actual parts with different feature sets from Diodes' DC to DC buck converter portfolio. On this slide, three of Diodes' 40 volt input, 3.5 amp output buck converters are shown. These parts are similar to each other. They all have LDO mode and frequency spread spectrum. However, they still have some differentiating features. Depending on the specific application requirements, one device may be preferable to use over another. For example, the AP64350 can have its frequency adjusted and has a compensation pin to allow the fine tuning of its closed loop response. The AP64351 also has a compensation pin. But instead of a pin to adjust its switching frequency, it has a soft start pin to adjust its soft start time. The AP64352 can adjust both its switching frequency and soft start time, but its loop response cannot be fine tuned. This slide shows a few more parts in different packages with a different number of pins to support a different number of features. The AP63357 device is a 32 volt input, 3.5 amp output buck converter with LDO mode, FSS, and both a compensation pin and PG pin. The AP62600 device is an 18 volt input, 6 amp output buck converter. It has the ability to select its operation mode and switching frequency. It also has adjustable soft start and a PG pin. The AP61102 is a 5.5 volt input, 1 amp output buck converter. It is in a smaller package and has fewer pins than the other converters discussed, but it still has a PG pin that can be used for power sequencing. It also has the ability to select its operation mode as PFM or 4th PWM through its enable pin. There are many different criteria to consider when selecting an appropriate DC to DC buck converter for any particular application. Some basic considerations are 1. What is the required input voltage range? 2. What is the required output voltage range? And what is the required output voltage accuracy for the application? 3. What is the required output load current? 4. What is the desired switching frequency? 5. What is the quiescent current requirement? 6. Are there any other previously discussed device features that are required? For example, does the application only want to operate in force PWM, or does it require the ability to select its operation mode to also operate in PFM if required? After an appropriate buck converter IC has been selected, the rest of the external components also need to be selected in order for the buck converter to work properly. First, the inductor. Here are some basic guidelines for selecting an inductor for most applications. Take the switching frequency of the device and use the first equation above to derive a recommended value for the inductor. For faster load transients, use a lower inductance. For lower switching loss and lower voltage ripple, use a higher inductance. As a rule of thumb, it is recommended that delta IL, the inductor current ripple, be approximately 30% to 40% of the rated maximum load current in peak current mode designs, and 30% to 50% in constant on-time designs. These inductor current ripple ranges are a good trade-off between load transient response and AC losses. The peak current, I peak, determines the required saturation current rating, which influences the size of the inductor. Saturating the inductor decreases the converter efficiency while increasing the temperatures of both the inductor and the internal power MOSFETs. Therefore, choosing the inductor with an appropriate saturation current rating is important. For most applications, it is recommended to select an inductor with a DC current rating of at least 35% higher than the maximum load current for margin. The next component consideration are the input capacitors. The purpose of the input capacitor is to reduce both the surge current drawn from the input supply as well as the switching noise from the device. The input capacitor must sustain ripple current produced during the on time of the high side FET. It must also have low ESR, equivalent series resistance, to minimize power dissipation due to the RMS input current. The RMS current rating of the input capacitor is a critical parameter and must be higher than the actual RMS input current. As a rule of thumb, select an input capacitor with an RMS current rating greater than half the maximum load current. Due to large DIDT through the input capacitor, Electrolytic or ceramic capacitors with low ESR should be used. If using a tantalum capacitor, it must be surge protected or else capacitor failure could occur. To be effective on the PCB, the input capacitor needs to be placed as closely as possible across the VN and ground pins of the device. The goal is to place the input capacitor as close to the IC with as little trace resistance as possible. It is recommended to use at least X7R type ceramic capacitors.
The next component consideration are the output capacitors. When selecting output capacitors, ceramics are a good choice as they require less space, have low ESR, and have good performance at high frequency. Again, it is recommended to use at least X7R type ceramic capacitors. The amount of capacitance required depends on the output voltage ripple and load transient requirements of the application. How the design performs is governed by the two equations on the slide. It is also important to take into design consideration of the capacitor deratings. The bottom right of this slide shows an example of a capacitor's DC bias derating curve. As this curve shows, the more DC bias there is across the capacitor, the lower its effective capacitance. After going through the exercise of selecting the best set of components, do not stop short of having a robust PCB layout. The end customer should work closely with the PCB design teams to follow PCB layout guidelines as closely as possible. This will help ensure first pass success and faster time to market. All of Diodes' latest DC to DC converter releases have a recommended PCB layout provided in its datasheet. Using Diodes' AP63200 buck converter as an example, the general PCB layout guidelines are 1. Place the input capacitors C1 as closely across VN, the input, and ground as possible. 2. Place the inductor L as close to SW, the switch node, as possible. 3. Place the output capacitors as close to ground as possible. 4. Place the feedback components R1, R2, and C4 as close to FB, the feedback pin, as possible. 5. If using four or more PCB layers, use at least the second and third layers as ground to maximize thermal performance. 6. Add as many vias as possible around both the ground pin and under the ground plane for heat dissipation to all the ground layers. 7. Add as many vias as possible around both the VN pin and under the VN plane for heat dissipation to all the VN layers. Here is a brief summary review of this module. It briefly described what a synchronous DC to DC buck converter is and explained its most basic of operations. It also introduced common features typically available in buck converters. Next, introduced were the items of consideration for selecting the appropriate buck converter IC as well as its external components, the inductor and input and output capacitors. Lastly, it wraps up with a general PCB layout guideline on how to place the components together optimally. We kindly thank you for viewing Diodes Incorporated's DC to DC product training module.